the rotational platform has been opened. In moments, the Long March 5B will lift off. The rocket will be carrying the 10 hook core module to space, the foundation elements of China's planned orbital space station. This launch will kick off a flurry of the missions to establish China's Tiangong space station by the end of 2022. And now scientists and engineers are making last minute preparations for the core module's maiden flight, which is to take off at Wenchang Space launch site in South China's Hainan province. And hello and welcome to our special coverage of China's space mission on CGTN. I'm Li Qiuyuan. And I'm Yang Zhao. And China has ambitious plan for its space programs to be carried out by the end of next year. It's expected to conduct 11 missions. That includes four crew spaceship flights, four cargo spaceship flights, as well as launching three space station modules. Tianhe Core module is the first major mission on the list. The missions are part of China's l larger goal to complete the building of its first space station by around 2022. And Tianhe's journey is made possible by its launch vehicle, the Long March 5B Y2 rocket. It's a new member of the Long March 5 family of rocket carriers. The deployment of the rocket carriers are part of the country's ambitions to explore outer space. This moment took nearly 10 years. The Long March 5B project was officially approved in November 2011 to undertake the task of launching modules of China's planned space station. From its preliminary development stage, it moved into trial development stage seven years later. The Long March 5B Y1 passed factory evaluation in January 2020. On May 5th, it successfully lifted off from the Wenchang Space Launch Center in Hainan Province. In February this year, development of the Long March 5B Y2 was completed and delivered to Wenchang. On April 23rd, it was transferred along with the Tianhe to the launch pad, where it awaits another countdown to China's space exploration ambitions. Specially developed for the construction of China's space, the Long March 5B is nearly 54 meters in height, about the size of an 18-story building. Its cowling is 20.5 meters in height, with a diameter of 5.2 meters, the biggest of its kind in the country at present. The Long March 5B runs on clean fuels like liquid hydrogen and oxygen. It has the biggest boost power in the Long March 5 families, making it possible for China to launch bigger spacecraft. The Long March 5B rocket can deliver 22 tons of payload at a time to low Earth orbit. It has the largest carrying capacity among China's existing rockets and is among the leaders in this category of rockets in the world. Compared with the Long March 5 rocket, which is like a long-distance runner launching satellites to further distances in the universe, the Long March 5B rocket is akin to a sprinter with strong explosive power. Deep space exploration missions, such as large-scale communication satellites and probes to Mars and the Moon, are completed by the Long March 5 rocket. The Long March 5B rocket mainly undertakes launch missions for the space station and its modules to low Earth orbits. The Long March 5B rocket is among China's new generation launch vehicles. It reflects the progress of the country's space engineering over the past decade. Experts say technology behind the 5B lays the groundwork for the development of heavier launch vehicles in the future. Well, joining us in the studio is Professor Yang Yuguang from China Aerospace Science and Industry Cooperation. And we have another guest via video link, Xu Yansong, the Director General in Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization. Welcome, you both. Now, let me start with you, Professor Yang. Talk to us a little bit about this rocket, right? What is the carrying capacity of this Long March 5B carrier rocket? As you mentioned, the Long March 5B is a new family, mem new member of the Long March 5 uh, family. 
uh, the ori original version of Long March 5 uh, has two and a half stage, which is mainly used to launch high altitude orbit uh, payloads, such as uh, geosynchronous orbit uh, satellites, such as the uh, lunar uh, probes or the Martian probes. Uh, so for the low Earth orbit, uh, it's not feasible to have, uh, launch uh, heavy payloads more than 20 tons. So this Long March 5B is a derivative of, of Long March 5, which only have one and a half stage. But the payload fairing is very big to uh, put the, uh, the space station in. The payload fairing is long more than uh, 20 meters, uh, and the capability is, uh, as mentioned, 25 times to the low Earth orbit. So a simpler structure, but a higher reliability, isn't it? Well, um, yeah, I got a question from Mr. Xu. So uh, we have to watch the Long March 5 and the Long March 5B have for, for this test of flight. Can you tell us, the, um, both of them are it's a Long March 5 family, so what is the difference between them? Well, the Long March 5B basically is a simplified version uh, for the low Earth orbit capabilities. As Professor Yang mentioned, Long March 5 uh, was for geosynchronous and deep space missions. Long March 5B basically removed the second stage, uh, which uh, plays a role for a higher altitude. So uh, that also enabled the rocket to have a larger fairing and larger capability to lo low Earth orbit with a single stage uh, launch. So that is this uh, fundamental difference between the 5 and the 5B. And Professor Yang, this rocket is the most powerful rocket that China has ever had. Why do we need the Long March 5B carrier rocket for this particular mission? You're correct. Uh, long March uh, 5B is the uh, largest long launch vehicle for China to launch uh, low Earth orbit payloads. Actually speaking, it is the uh, third, la uh, third largest uh, rocket in the world. In the, world? Uh, the, fr the most uh, powerful is uh, Falcon Heavy. Uh, the second is Delta IV Heavy. Uh, the Falcon Heavy has a payload capability to load orbit of about uh, 63 tons, and the uh, Delta IV uh, Heavy has a capability of 28 tons. Well, our Long March uh, 5B is uh, uh, the top three uh, launch vehicle in the world have a capability of 25 tons. You know that our uh, space station is composed of uh, three modules in the initial stage, the Tianhe core module, the Wentian uh, experimental module, and the Mengtian experimental module. Uh, all these three modules has a mass of more than uh, 22 tons. So we don't have other choices. We can only use the Long March 5B to launch these three uh, modules into st space and combine them together to construct the station. Well, thank you, Dr. Yan. And for the latest, let's go to our reporter, Ning Hong, at uh, Wenchang Spacecraft launch site. Hello, Ning Hong, and how are the preparation going so far? Hello. Hmm. Well, yes, now we're in the platform very close to the launch pad and the rocket is about roughly three kilometers uh, before uh, in front of the launch pad. You can see now the rocket and the service platform is now open. The rocket, uh, we, we, we have learned that the, the propellants now have been added into the, orbit, uh, into the rocket. You can see that uh, there are vapors showing beside the rocket. That's because it is using the uh, low temperature liquid propellants. And it's now uh, people need to fill the propellants, continue filling it until before the launch. And we're now about a half an hour before the launch, and you can see that this is a very open platform. We could see directly, uh, we could directly see the launch pad, and also uh, this is the rocket that carrying the core module of China's space station, the Tianhe, and we'll soon uh, entering a new era where China will have its own space station. And also the rocket now uh, they're using is the Long March 5B rocket, uh, like like you said, it's a specially made rocket for uh, to sending. Uh, modules like a spacecraft into the orbit, lowest orbit. And also in the meantime, uh, we, we have learned that uh, the weather here today is not very good, but it's a little bit cloudy, a little bit windy, but it seems that, uh, well, people are confident about, uh, about the launch. So uh, the launch is, is very likely to be continue, uh, and it, it will be launched about uh, half an hour from now on. Well, thank you, Ning Hong. That's our reporter from the Wenchang Spacecraft Launch Center. And now let's get back to our uh, studio interview with. Um, so I got this question for uh, Mr. Xu. So uh, we have to, we have noticed that the Long March 5B carrier rocket has the super large uh, payload fairing. And why is that? Well, basically because of the space station is large. Uh, but traditionally, we have 3.35 diameter uh, launch vehicle. This is basically due to the limitations that we have launch site inland in China. 
uh, limited by the railway capabilities and tunnels that will have to limit the ferrying. So the Loma 5B has the longest and largest ferrying so far. Uh, the dimension is over 22 meters along uh, for the ferrying only, and uh, it's uh, more than five meter diameter. So it's capable of uh, engulfing the uh, maximum dimension of the Tianhe uh, segment, and also future missions, as uh, Professor Yang mentioned, Meng Tian and Wen Tian. So those are three largest segments, like like the human body and both arms of the station. So it is due to largely due to the uh, dimension required. Yes, um, in, a, in a later uh, we were going to see that uh, super long fairing that as long as over uh, 20 meters is the yeah. that's that the super one uh, that is very critical and you were just watching live pictures coming from that Wenchang uh, spacecraft launch site but Mr. Yang let me bring you into this there's a bit of green technology involved in the fuels right talk to us about the clean fuels that the rocket is going to use Yes, you know that uh, Long March 5 family is called the new generation of China's launch vehicles. Uh, before that, uh, is, uh, currently in service is Long March uh, 2, 3, and 4 series. Uh, all these launch vehicles use uh, uh, UDMH or unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine as a fuel and use uh, nitro uh, nitrogen uh, tetroxide as the uh, oxidizer. The uh, UDMH is highly toxic, and the uh, NTO, or the nitrogen uh, uh, di uh, uh, dioxide, is highly uh, corrosive. So all these are uh, toxic fuels, toxic uh, propellants uh, during the past. Well, our new generation, including this long, uh, long March 5, use a uh, uh, cryogenic uh, propulsion system. Uh, the four boosters use the kerosene as the fuel and use oxygen as the outsider. While the core stage of Long March 5 uh, or Long March 5B use the uh, liquid hydrogen as the fuel and use liquid oxygen as the uh, uh, oxidizer. So you see uh, kerosene liquid oxygen and the liquid hydrogen are all environmental friendly, uh, no toxic and no corrosive uh, components. So you see that uh, this will be uh, more friendly to Earth and more easy to use. But on the other hand, it also brings some difficulties. You see that liquid hydrogen and the liquid oxygen must be being kept in a very low temperature. So it requires, uh, it raises a very high requirement to the launch pad and uh, to the launch procedure. You may see the uh, white smokes or the white fog uh, coming out uh, from the vehicle itself. That is the uh, vaporized That's liquid vapor. oxygen. Mm -hmm. And we were having that shot of the countdown clock. We we're just 40 minutes away from the launch and you were seeing uh, the shot of the command center. People are doing these final preparations and uh, Mr. Xu, how does the Long March 5 uh, compare with other heavy lift rockets that are in operation now? We're having this great view of this Long March 5 rocket of the launch pad now. Yes, the Long March 5 has, uh, like uh, uh, Professor Yang mentioned, the, uh, its unique characters. Use the liquid kerosene as the strapped arm boosters. As you can see, uh, the total configuration, there are four strapped arm boosters along with the centerpiece, which is uh, YF-77 uh, liquid uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen engine. And so this is a character that, uh, you know, you, uh, when you launch, you use the kerosene as propellant uh, in the atmosphere. So compared with the other vehicles, we have upgraded the, the centerpiece, which is the core engine, into a liquid, uh, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, which has a, a better uh, rash ratio in proportion once it enters outer space. So the rocket is very efficient and also environmental friendly, as uh, Professor Yang mentioned, the Hainan launching site is built for such a fuel only. So UDMH and nitrogen tetroxide is not part of the plan for Hainan, only kerosene and oxygen. So it's very clean and also very efficient rocket. Yes, this is a new type of fuel that we are using in the Lomars 5B is uh, more environmental friendly. Um, and uh, we, we go ahead. What, what can we expect it from China's next heavy lift to carrier rocket, Dr. Yang? Uh, well, you see that the leaders of China Aerospace has expressed their wish to have uh, human missions to the moon in the future. Yep. And also, in the, just uh, after the, the two sessions of this year, has, uh, has announced that uh, we have the plan to have the uh, human missions in, in the future. So we now is in the stage of key technology uh, preparation. So you see that we already have some tests about the 
10 meter module of the core stage of the future super heavy launch vehicle and also the 510 level thrust uh, rocket engines uh, which is in development. So you can sooner or later we can have this heavy launch vehicle to prepare for our astronauts to walk on the moon. Yes, Mr. Mr. Xu, uh, are we going to expect it to see some more heavier and bigger and larger rocket in China in the future? <laughs> I'm sure we're going to see that because uh, we have already invested in the uh, evaluation and assessment of the launch uh, vehicle. Uh, we have to find the appropriate purpose for the development of such a vehicle. For example, our human missions to the moon and beyond. So the, uh, the, heavy, uh, the heavy lifting, well, we call it Long March 9 sometimes, uh, is uh, twice as height as of what we're going to see, uh, we're seeing now. This rocket uh, we're seeing, Long March 5B, is is only 53.7 meters in, uh, in height. But the new generation, uh, Long March 9, let's call it for now, it would be more than uh, 97 meters, it's almost 100 meters tall and 10 meters uh, in diameter. So it's twice the size of this uh, uh, Long March 5 series. So we, uh, we, we do look forward to see that in a decade time or even less, uh, because critical technologies are being tested and evaluated. And uh, once we have that, I'm sure the human missions and more ambitious programs will be implemented. All right, we were seeing the monitors showing the humidity, the temperatures at the launch site, and we were just less than 35 minutes to go to the launch. But Professor Yang, uh, it looks like we're having a bit of cast sky, overcast sky there. Uh, is it an ideal climate or weather for the launch? Uh, that doesn't uh, have much influence to our launch. You see that uh, for, uh, for launch procedure, uh, uh, there are many conditions we must meet. For instance, there should not be thunder and lightning uh, during the trajectory of the rocket. And also, uh, before, uh, before the launch, the wind should also be uh, well monitored because the wind has very great influence during the flight. And also, you see that uh, because until now, the human being cannot go into orbit with only one single stage, so we need to drop our stages uh, in the sea or in the land. Mm -hmm. For this uh, Wenchang uh, spacecraft launch site, our uh, boosters, our payload fairings of this Long Launch 5B will drop into the sea. So before the launch, we should see, the, we, we should confirm that during the dropping areas, there is no uh, any vehicles, uh, either ships or planes, uh, coming through this uh, this area. So we must uh, keep this safe, and also uh, we must uh, ensure that. Other system, for instance, such as such as the uh, telecontrol, uh, telecommunication, and tracking system, is okay. We have ground stations and also have space tracking ships. All must be in good condition. All right, Dr. Yang and Dr. Xu, stay with us. Now, China is set to launch the core module of its first space station today, as we've been talking about. And CDTN's reporter Yu Yang takes a look at a model to show us what it looks like and how it was developed. As the main control cabin of China's first space station, the core module of Tianhe is about 16.6 meters long with a diameter of over 4 meters. It's divided into three parts, the connector, the life support and the control section, as well as the section for resources. The connector looks like a hexagon. It has two berth ports for two lab modules called Wentian and Mengtian and three docking ports for the Shenzhou crew spacecraft the cargo and other vehicles. It also has an exit on top where astronauts can conduct the spacewalks. This is the living area of the crew. It's about 50 cubic meters. It's also called the thinner area. It's got three sleeping areas and one sanitary part. This is the thicker part, which is the working area where astronauts control the daily operation of Space Center while conducting some scientific experiments. If we take a look from the outside, this is the resources part of Tianhe. It's responsible for fueling the space station. Once operational, the space station can host the three astronauts for six months and up to six astronauts by replacement. Tianhe, along with its Long March 5B Y2 carrier rocket, has currently been transported to China's Wenchang spacecraft launch site in Hainan province and is all set to kick off its journey into space. Yu Yang, CGTN, Beijing.
And for those of you who are joining us just now, you're now watching our special coverage of China launching the core module of its space station. That was a shot of the command center showing you the humidity, the weather of today. And this is a great view of the rocket we're launching today. The rocket was especially developed to launch the space station modules for China. And today it's about to launch the 22-ton Tianhe space station core module into the space. And we call it the Chubby Five or Pangwu in Chinese because of its size. Yeah. It's a heavy like lift launch nickname. vehicle. Mm -hmm. like that nickname. Uh, in, in, in our field, it is called the aspect ratio, uh, which means the, the length and the diameter, this ratio. Uh, Long March 5 has a diameter of 5 meters, so the aspect ratio is not very high. Mm -hmm. So this makes, uh, means that it is more rigid uh, than other vehicles. And also, uh, for, uh, for, for, for this design, it brings some convenience uh, of the flight. And looking from here, it might not sit that big to you, but just give you a sense of how big this is. The Long March 5B is about 53.7 meter long with a, like Professor Yang just mentioned, 5 meter diameter core stage and also uh, four strap-on boosters, as you can see now at the bottom of your screen. Those are the side boosters. Um, the diameter of that side booster alone is about 3.35 uh, meters, right? That is as exactly. big as a normal rocket, such as the Long yes. March 2F or Long March 7 rocket, which is pretty impressive. Yes. Uh as, uh, as, uh, as Mr. Xu has mentioned, because of the limitation of the railway tunnels, so our inland uh, launch site can only use the diameter of the 3.35. Uh, uh, so that is the uh, uh, diameter of the, even the core stages of other rocket vehicles. But for this uh, launch vehicle, the boosters has a, a so big diameter. Mm. And we should also emphasize that the, the four boosters provide more than 90% of the mm -hmm. thrust, uh, of the total thrust during the liftoff. Uh, because they use a, a powerful rocket engine called YF-100, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, has a thrust of about 120 tons. So each rocket booster uses two of these engines. Uh, so totally, the four boosters can provide a thrust about uh, 960 tons. You can see that uh, this is the biggest uh, launch complex in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, just now we can see from the camera that there are some white, uh, white forks uh, coming out from the top what of the that? boosters. That is the oxygen. That okay. is the uh, vaporized uh, uh, liquid oxygen. Because uh, you know that it must be kept in a very low temperature and uh, uh, by yo, yo. vaporizing. Okay. All right, that is the call out you're hearing now. It is 30 minutes prior to launch. It is T minus 30 minutes. And at this point, what, what happens here, Professor Yang? Well, we have a countdown in different stages. For the, three, uh, for the 30 minutes uh, countdown, we've already uh, completed uh, many uh, checking of the critical systems, uh, for instance, uh, such as the uh, telemetry and the tracking systems, the uh, space tracking ships, and also to confirm that other systems are OK. Moreover, we should also test some of the subsystems on board the vehicle itself. Mm. Uh, so uh, each must be kept in a, a good condition and monitored by the data down uh, and also, uh, you see, you can see also there are some small arms on the vehicle because we have multiple plugs connected to the vehicle, mm. and one by one they will be disconnected. And finally, the major plug, uh, the main plug, will be disconnected, and the vehicle will be completely, completely uh, depending on the power supply of itself. At that moment, we can perform the launch. And it is also the time where you know the last batch of team members pulling away from the launch pad, is it? Uh, so at, at, at this moment, there is no ground staff near the vehicle mm -hmm. because it will be very dangerous. So uh, there are procedures, uh, or the safety procedures ensure the safety of our staff. You mm -hmm. see that uh, the fueling has been completed several hours before. Uh, mm -hmm. At this moment, the, the ground staff must leave the launch pad because mm -hmm. if there, uh, any uncertain things happen, uh, the, uh, the explosion will hurt, uh, stress the uh, life of our ground staff. And the umbilicals we're looking at, they are still attached to this rocket. Why, why is it? Because we still need uh, connections, some cable con connection to the vehicle, such as the power supply, uh, such as uh, uh, a monitor of the signal and the control commands to the vehicle. So uh, until the last minute, maybe uh, one minute or uh, just uh, s several seconds before the launch, uh, finally we, uh, we disconnect the, the main plug. What else those cable and uh, at this it seems a lot of the pumping tubes there are so connecting yes. this, the main body of the rocket and mm -hmm. the service structure. Uh, they have been the pumping the, I think it's the fuel, right? Yeah. It's just, they need to keep 
fueling that rocket until the last minute. Yes, uh, you see that uh, we need the storage batteries to provide uh, electricity uh, during the flight and uh, before the launch, just after the disconnection. Uh, so the, we must save the, the energy of the storage, uh, right. uh, storage batteries because the ca uh, capacity is limited. Mm -hmm. So just uh, uh, at, at this moment, still there are cables connected to the vehicle to uh, provide power supply. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah, that is the cost that we have to pay for uh, making the more environmental friendly engines and the more environmental friendly fuels, right? Yeah, that's true. Yes. And the timing of the launch, Professor Yang, uh, talk to us a little bit about it. How did they choose this launch window? I would imagine a lot of factors went into this decision. Yeah. Well, you see that because this is the uh, first uh, launch of our uh, Tiangong uh, uh, space station. Theoretically speaking, it only uh, need to in, uh, launch into a uh, orbit with the right uh, attitude and the right inclination. Mm -hmm. So uh, theoretically speaking, there is no much limitation to this. But also, uh, there are some limitations about the, the sunlight. You see mm -hmm. that. Uh, when the uh, Tianhe module come into the orbit, the sunlight must in the right direction to yeah. ensure the power supply of the vehicle. So the launch window is limited by this uh, limit uh, by this consideration. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the uh, the angle between the direction of the sunlight and the outer plane must be less than thirty degrees. Mm -hmm. And also uh, this uh, because uh, the launch this this is the uh, condition of the sunlight. And also uh, the the time of the launch uh, we must ensure that when the uh, rocket the end stage of the rocket is separated from the uh, space station. Uh, when the uh, solar panels is deployed, there are also sunlight to ensure the power supply. Yeah, so sometimes you, we saw this uh, kind of launching window in the middle of the night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. this is the launch of the first module. For the second module and other ships, the things will be changed because they match the Why launch into the first uh, orbital plane. The accuracy of the launch window is only one second, which is mm -hmm. called zero launch window. Zero launch window. So once yes. it's missed it, you have to be... Well, Another day. Oh, okay. They have to totally reschedule then. Well, it's maybe better than the Mars exploration because once it's missed, it's going to need to wait another 26 months, right? Uh, maybe the next, uh, for this, maybe the next uh, 24 hours. Uh, yeah. Uh, every day we have a launch video for, this, uh, for, the, for the next vehicle to go into the same orbital plane of the station. And Mr. Xu, let me bring you into our discussion. We are looking at the view of the command center at the Wenchang Spacecraft Launch yeah. Center. And talk to us about this launch site. I mean, there are four major launch sites in China, right? This is a great coastal view. I mean, this, yeah. sat this satellite launch center or launch center is located in coastal regions, but we already have another one called Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. That was way yeah. up north in the, in the Gobi, Gobi Desert, desert yeah. right? That one is for launching astronauts into space. Well, this one you're looking at is responsible for launching cargo spacecraft into space. Why is that, Mr. Xu? Well, I think uh, this is uh, like previous, uh, we have just mentioned about the fueling system. Uh, uh, we have developed the new generation uh, uh, launch vehicle, uh, which is based on liquid kerosene and oxygen. Uh, that fueling system is part of the infrastructure of the launch site. So the Wenchang satellite launch site is only for kerosene, uh, oxygen and hydrogen fuels. Uh, there is no other fuel uh, system that you, is available for the rocket. Uh, in, in Wenchang. So, so new generations starting from Long March 5 uh, onward, such as 6, Long March 7 and 8, uh, will all use the same fueling system. So mm -hmm. all of those rockets you will see in the future will be launched from this particular launching site, including the Long March 7, which is due to be launched very soon uh, following this mission of Long March 5. Uh, as you mentioned about Ju Chuan, I think that we, we also need to mention about the system engineering of such a uh, complex program as human missions. Uh, the system in, uh, comprises not only the launch vehicle, but also the TTNC support system, the ground facility, the manufacturing, the operation, and the human missions, including life support system. All of this will be put together and to, com to form a complex and very complicated system. So as you can see, at the launching site, they're preparing for the launch of the Tianhe, and also busy at uh, Jiuquan, they're busy with the astronauts' preparation. So once the Tianhe is in orbit, in the right uh, inclinations and orbit, as Professor Yang mentioned, uh, once, in, uh, once in a day opportunity, so once we capture that window and we put, uh, insert this uh, uh, Tianhe into the right orbit, and we will start preparing for the following missions. 
And of, of course, the uh, designing of the orbit as well as the launching opportunity is also based largely on, on the orbit and communication capabilities. It has to be flying over the Chinese territory that we are able to see and witness to control the rendezvous docking in the future for the human missions. Uh, well, well uh, Mr. Xu, uh, the Long March 5B is going to uh, launch from the Wenchang, and how long uh, can we expect it for this flight? Like, uh, how long did, did it take, did it to, uh, take to uh, enter this orbit? Roughly, we, we, we consider that uh, launching opportunity, uh, launching uh, timing uh, by seconds. Uh, I think it's around 1,270 some seconds uh, before we, have, we see the insertion. Uh, That's about 10 minutes? Gen yes. Uh, so once it's in there, uh, they will see the deployment of the solar array of the Tianhe and then start communicating with the Tianhe. So right now, the ground, the ground crews, as, as, as well as those connecting uh, ports, or the umbilicals you can see uh, from the ground to the uh, launch vehicle, is basically communicating with the launch vehicle as well as communicating with the uh, Tianhe, uh, uh, Tianhe uh, station. So once uh, it's launched, we'll focus on the control of the launch vehicle and once deployed, we'll, we'll communicate with the Tianhe directly with using uh, TTNC network, that including uh, the ocean-going ships as well as the ground crew. So it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a process that will take uh, very close connections between each other. And let's talk a little bit about the Tianhe core module, right? Because she is the star today. Yes. Um, you were looking at the bottom of the rocket, but at the tip of that rocket, the Tianhe core module was actually encased in that huge casing called rocket fairing, right? And Dr. Young, talk to us about it. China hopes to have its first space station operation by 2022. But how is this core module instrumental to the space station's construction? Well, of course, the, uh, the core module will be the most uh, critical step of the construction of our station. In fact, this uh, Tianhe one, uh, the accurate name is uh, the test core module. So, uh, the, it will be, it is, an, at, at this moment, it is not the formal core module of the station. So, after launch, we will perform many critical or key technology demonstration as testi testing. If all these are okay, we can formally uh, change the name to the uh, core module. If something wrong, we must have some improvement. We will launch a second core module. That will be the formal one. So uh, before this, we must perform uh, the uh, demonstration of many key technologies. For instance, the long-term residence of, of, uh, of astronauts in space, uh, the regenerative life support system, and also other, uh, other technologies to operate so heavy uh, uh, spacecraft like this. And also, we need to test the transpositioning technologies for the, uh, for the experimental modules. You see, we choose a different technology comparing with other countries, although we also uh, choose a modular design like the Mir station and the space, uh, International Space Station. But we, uh, when the uh, Tian, uh, Meng Tian and the Wen Tian modules is stocked, we transfer its uh, position by a special mechanism. So ma we must uh, test this technology. Well, thank you, uh, gentlemen. Uh, stay with us. And China is set to have its own space station orbiting the Earth by the end of the 2022. So how many missions is this going to take to get everything up and running and keep it that way? CGTN's Wulei explains. It took me only a few minutes to finish this model of the Chinese space station. But if you're going to build an actual one in space, it's not that simple. China's Tiangong space station project consists of three stages, key technical verification, construction, and operation. The successful maiden launch of China's Long March 5B rocket in May of 2020 was a key milestone validating this rocket as a viable vehicle to lift the station's core module called Tianhe into its designated orbit. Tiangong will be a T-shaped structure with the Tianhe core module and Mengtian and Wentian experimental modules. Besides the three launches to put the modules in orbit, China has planned four manned missions and four cargo missions. 
11 intensive launches in total by the end of 2022. All of China's manned space missions will rely on this Long March 2F rocket. The Shenzhou spacecraft sits on the top of the rocket. Once the core module and later the entire Tiangong station are in place, this specific craft will dock with the core module while in orbit. Chinese astronauts will not only conduct a number of experiments, but also carry out extravehicular activities to help complete the construction of the space station. Living and working in space for long periods of time requires more supplies. This is where the Long March 7 carrier rocket comes in. It will be used to carry the Tianzhou cargo ship, which will contain food, water, and other necessary supplies to the space station. All of these missions are integral parts, furthering China's endeavors for space exploration. Wulei, CGTN. Welcome back. You're now watching our special coverage of China's latest special launch. We're just 16 minutes away from that launch and staying with us are our guests, Mr. Xu Yanzhong and Dr. Yang Yuguang. So, uh, Dr. Yang, let's start with you this time. To construct such a space station is planned as the last step of China's manned space program. That was envisioned firstly in 1992, right? 29 years in the making. I mean, how have previous steps contributed to this moment? Well, you see, there are three fundamental technologies needed for construction of a space station. The first one is the transportation, uh, the crude transportation from the Earth to the, uh, to the outer space and back. This is the first technology. The mm -hmm. se second is, as Willie has mentioned, the, the EVA, EVA or extravehicular activity technologies, mm -hmm. which we accomplished by the Shenzhou 7 mission in 2008. And the third technology is uh, rendezvous and docking technologies, which mm -hmm. we completed testing by the Tiangong 1 uh, target vehicle and the Shenzhou 8, 9, and 10 spaceships. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, with the uh, Tiangong 2 and uh, Shenzhou 11, Tiangong 1 mission, we mastered the technology of, of midterm residence in space mm -hmm. by uh, Mr. Jing Haipeng and Mr. Chen Dong. They stayed there for uh, a month. And also, with the Tianzhou 1 cargo ship, we master the technology of refueling, which is also critical for the future space station. So with these preparation works, we master most of the major technologies of constructing a space station, but not all the technologies. So we still need the uh, demonstration of okay. technologies during this Tianhe all 1 right. and the Tianzhou 2, Shenzhou 12 mission. All right, 15 minutes to go till the launch. That's right. Um, all right, you hit the Yeah, the controller is saying that as the 15 minutes uh, count down. And Mr. Yang, uh, well, yeah, this is the whole plan is, uh, has been carried out step by step. It's going into your duck. Uh, Mr. Xu, I want to I want to ask you that uh, what did we learn from this, those uh, previous missions like Tian, Tiangong 1, Tiangong 2, and Shenzhou spacecraft? Well, the Tiangong 1, we learned something very special. Uh, let's talk about Tiangong 2 first. Yeah. Uh, rendezvous docking, as well as the connection uh, between the cargo ship, uh, as, uh, as, as uh, they, there are two ways, uh, automatic uh, or automated uh, docking and rendezvous, mm -hmm. and uh, man-controlled rendezvous and docking. So uh, we have demonstrated all that, and also we demonstrated the fueling uh, of the station uh, in microwave, microgravity environment. This is uh, crucial because now once you're in microgravity environment, the fuels uh, are floating instead of just dropping on the on the bottom of the, of the container. So the fueling can be vo very challenging uh, and also requires special technologies. And Dr. So we, Yang, you were, you were watching the live feed with us. What was disconnected just then? Well, that is a cable which uh, monitoring some of the subsystems, some critical systems of the vehicle. You see that we have a control system called the GNC or uh, Guidance Navigation and Control System. Mm -hmm. We must uh, keep that the, uh, for instance, such as the uh, uh, gyroscopes, uh, the accelerometers, and the onboard computers are okay. So we have the cables to uh, have data links that download the uh, critical uh, parameters of the, of these instruments. And uh, and before the launch, uh, you see that there are several cables. Uh, so just now we just uh, disconnected one of them. There are also other uh, cables. Uh, just uh, before the uh, launch, we will disconnect the, the last one, which provide, uh, provide also power supply to the vehicle. 
And now, mm -hmm. uh, because some of these system can already been okay, we also hear from the front, from the ground control center, there are the Tongguling, which have mm -hmm. a ground uh, tracking station, tracking is station. also okay. All right, so. about 10 minutes into the final preparations. Yeah, with those, uh, the cables that's been plugged in, this the main body of the rocket, we're still, uh, we can still manipulate that rocket through those cables, We right? can still send the commands to the vehicle. Yeah. And also mm -hmm. we can get data, the monitoring of the old systems of the vehicle from these yeah. cables. Right. Uh, so yeah. also uh, the most important, the power supply to the vehicle. Yeah. As I mentioned, yeah. because the storage battery only have a limited capacity. But yeah. after the cutoff of those cables, uh, the rocket is on its own. Exactly. So just uh, several seconds before the, the launch, the onboard computer will control all the critical system of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. and, and Mr. Xu, we were looking at the launch team in our screen now. Uh, talk to us, what is it like for them? I mean, during these last few minutes, few seconds leading up to time zero, I mean, it is one of those heart-pounding moments, I would imagine, right? It's got to be extremely nerve-wracking, but at the same time, you've got to keep calm and focus on what you do. Uh, what do you think is going through their minds? Well, uh, as we started from 30 minutes countdown to all this moment, uh, there's a sequence that I've already designed many times, and so mm -hmm. they have also practice all of this many times. So I think their uh, their lack of, uh, they're, they're good in confidence because the data, as Professor Yang mentioned, are, are constantly feeding back from the rocket. Mm. Uh, even though the, the cables are disconnected, we still have remote uh, uh, TTNC uh, signals. Mm. And we have also uh, all the sensors that is working. So uh, the ground crew or in the command room, they're uh, controlling, monitoring, and, and keep constant eye on those signals, mm -hmm. on those uh, 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 sensors, uh, on the data, some parameters. Uh, so uh, if everything goes normal, because they have the chart to compare, and if uh, everything goes normal, they will go to count down to, to the last minute or the last second. If not, they will, they will have the authority to call, call off the, the launch. Mm -hmm. uh, we have this uh, happen before, uh, even a second before the launch, we call off the launch uh, itself because of the anomaly occurred mm -hmm. in the launch vehicle. So even disconnected, we still have all the connections made to the launch vehicle. And Mr. Xu, um, in a previous one, we mentioned that uh, the carry out by the NASA, we can, we can saw them from the live streaming that there is the go, no go procedure. It's a poll mm, to decide it, polling, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, whether they're going to, to give a call uh, give a go. to go, right? Mm -hmm. um, are, are we going to have the same procedure here in China? Exactly. Yes, we do. We do. <laughs> and, uh, all right, later, uh, Mr. Yang. <laughs> Many similarities, and also we have our own system of calling off the, the launch. All right, 10 minutes out. 10 minutes out. This is the final status check. We are going to here. Oh, that's the call out from the commander. We can, uh, we can hear from the ground control center that the chief commander has announced this uh, T minus 10 minutes countdown. Mm -hmm. And what happened prior to this, uh, around this time, is that the air conditioning for the fairing has been cut off, right? Talk to us about it. You see, it. that uh, uh, the, the temperature and the other environmental param parameters must be kept in the co correct range during the launch. So there is an air conditioner inside the payload fairing. We, mm -hmm. It also needs the power supply. Just before the launch, because only 10 minutes, we can ensure that even if it's shut down, the temperature is still in the, the right range. So mm -hmm. uh, at this moment, we can shut down the air conditioner and go on. And as Yen Sun has mentioned, mm -hmm. we not only have signals from the cables, we also have wireless connections. Uh, you mm -hmm. see that the payload fairing is made of metals. So we must prepare some special uh, non-metal uh, material uh, mm -hmm. to uh, have a window to mm -hmm. allow the uh, radio signals to come in through. That's right. That's a comfort. That's a most a comfortable zone within yeah. that fairing. And yep. the Tianhe core module includes the living quarters for astronauts and control center, right? It needs to provide life support for astronauts, so air, water. I mean, how is that being met, Dr. Yang? Well, you see that uh, the, from, from the outside, we can see that the, uh, the, the core module is comp composed of a node, a small cylindrical segment, and a large cylindrical segment. The bedroom mm -hmm. or the sleeping chamber of the three astronauts yeah. is in the small cylindrical segment. Okay. Also, there is a toilet there. <laughs> <laughs> they gotta have that. Gotta have that. Yeah, Mr. Chu, can we can we go ahead with our go no go question? Um, I'm sure. still very curious about that. Uh, we have been interrupted by the countdown. 
Well, yes, uh, I think the go and no-go is, is basically on the, the launch vehicle uh, statics. Uh, we, we see the uh, uh, pressure of the uh, engines and all the engines are okay and all the uh, ground uh, control and systems are, are fine. Because once you're, you have the liftoff, you have the rocket all, only controlled by the TTNC system and all the data has to be transmitted back. So uh, we have to uh, make sure that all the uh, sensors in different part of the uh, rocket, in particular the, the engine system, the fueling system, mm -hmm. and the, uh, all of that has to be in the right, uh, right temperature and right pressure. Uh, this happened before because we've seen uh, anomalies of the one of the sensors that could be affected uh, not only by the rocket itself but also by a uh, surrounding environment. As you, 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 uh, as you know, the Hainan is a highly humid and, and high temperature areas. So that also happened in, in, in before uh, yes. for the liquid kerosene or oxygen engine. So all, all of the factors are, are compiled together. Uh, uh, some of the some of them are critical enough to call off the launch. So, but fingers crossed. Uh, certainly, we hope this one is a is a, a smooth one. All right, that's a that was a great split screen. But you're now watching at side boosters of the rocket. We are just moments away from that liftoff. Uh, also, talk to us, Dr. Young. The energy about the core module. I mean, everything run in the module needs energy, right? And I suppose solar energy is the main source. Yes, uh, we. Uh, you see, that's the final step of the launch. The uh, in, in which case we can announce the successful launch success of this mission will be the deployment or the unfolding of the solar panels. That means we, the, the, the core module can have continuous uh, power supplies from the sun. You see that our core module have a uh, one-dimensional uh, one uh, one uh, SADA or the solar array driving assembly uh, which can rotate and uh, uh, let the, the, the surface of the solar panels meet the sun. All right. And they do have Wi-Fi up there, I heard. Is it yeah. true that they're yeah. going to have 5G yes. coverage? Yeah, they can yes. play the video games uh, and talk to their family. Uh, <laughs> may, maybe they can play a video game, but maybe the, uh, the astronauts should bring a, a laptop to, to the station. So you see that this happened during the uh, operation of the International Space Station. Uh, but you see that but the most uh, favorite um, uh, entertainment of the astronauts is not video game. It's just uh, watching the beautiful Earth Aww. and uh, taking yeah. photos of them of their family, of their cities, and other countries. That is That's great. Right. And the core module, eventually the space station will be flying in low Earth orbit, right, Dr. Yeon? Yeah. And yeah. it's going to be affected somehow by gravity. So once in a while, it needs to readjust its position, and that needs refuel. How is refuel, <laughs> refueling going to be uh, achieved? Uh, well, you see, that we adopt a uh, uh, docking mechanism called the APAS, Go or the Androgenous. Oh, five minutes come down. Five, five minutes, minutes. down. We are entering the final stages, really. Oh, there you see Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. That is the live picture coming out from the Beijing Aerospace City. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang is among the audience who are watching this launch very closely. That is Mr. Wang Huning, member of the Standing Committee of the CPC Political Bureau. They are there to watch this, which really speaks volume about how important Beijing sees this mission, isn't it, Dr. Yang? Uh, uh, in every important mission, our uh, Beijing Flight Control Center also taking a very important role okay. to give commands. So you see, there are, there are control centers in Beijing and also in the front, actually speaking, in Wenchang, which mm -hmm. controls the uh, rocket itself. But also we have cent uh, control centers in Xi'an to control the TTNC system. Okay. And the Chinese leaders are showing up in this uh, control center. Hmm. It's another uh, symbol to show how important today yeah. is exactly. launch is. And very interesting, that Beijing Aerospace City you were seeing uh, is also the main training base for China's astronauts, right? A lot of Meet the Press events were actually held there. Yeah. It's just in the northern part of Beijing City, right? Mm. And yeah. the primary function of that uh, Aerospace City is also known. All right, this is uh, uh, the live picture coming out from uh, Wenchang. That is. Mr. Zhang Youxia, who is in charging of this mission. The chief commander of China's manned space program, or no? Right. Yeah. right and this Thank launch you. is going to kick off the series of launching and uh, coming, I think it's in two years, right? Yes. There's about 11, uh, 10 more launches except for today. 11 launches. Yeah, 11, 11 more total. launches. 11 including launches this in one. total. 
And this launch is going to be followed by a manned mission. No, there soon. the second one will be the launch of, uh, as Wuli have mentioned, the Tianzhou Two cargo mm -hmm. ship, which will be launched also in this in uh, The cruise mission will be the third one. All right, that is T minus three minutes. We're here in the call out. Three minutes out, less than three minutes prior to liftoff. They are going through some final status check, I would assume. And quite a nerve-wracking moment right, I mean, for the uh, whole launch team and for all of us who are yeah. watching. Yeah, just approaching this, uh, I'm getting excited yeah, to see that. A gazillion things right. must be going on, and everything needs to be done right in an orderly fashion. Any tiny mistakes right. I that get, could be catastrophic. <laughs> I want to get back to the very fundamental question for, for both of you, Mr. Yan and Mr. Chu. Um, what is the significance of the construction of a China space station? Why, why do we need a space station? Uh, because this is a uh, one important but important step for us to be a uh, advanced country mm -hmm. in space field. We've already been a big country. We hope be, we can be. Uh, this will be a very uh, important milestone for us. And also, it is not only the national laboratory in space, but also a very important international cooperation platform. Well, I think it's also very important for future human missions, either to the moon or beyond. So if you want to be an interplanetary species, this is the very first step. Did we see the umbilicals pulling away? Is this about the time that the umbilicals Maybe several pulling away? seconds later. Several so seconds later. Second is the, the, the final plug or the major, uh, the, the main plug will be disconnected. And that will indicate that the launch pad team has given yeah, yeah. a go. And just the before this, uh, this dis disconnection, the, the power supply will change from the ground to the vehicle itself using the storage batteries. Two minutes, I think two it's two minutes. Two minutes out. Yeah, I heard that. It's two mm -hmm. minutes. Yeah, we're watching this uh, there Long also March 5B. I think that's for uh, free 35 meter uh, diameter boosters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us more about that booster. The booster, uh, the as you mentioned, the booster uh, has a diameter of 3.35 meters using liquid uh, Liquid Oxy oxygen, oxygen and the kerosene as the propellant, okay. and each have a thrust of. Oh, I thought it was two. a solid. I, I used to have thought it no, was. No, no, it's not solid. It's, it's not liquid, solid. liquid, liquid so rocket. Right. All right. So that was using the liquid oxygen, right? The, uh, the cross stage used uh, liquid, liquid Be oxygen. Right. Okay, yeah. we're seeing the countdown clock there. Yeah. Everybody's watching that. So. All right, T minus 60 seconds, one minute prior to liftoff. Truly an incredible moment to witness. Well, I'm getting nervous right now. Yeah. There are also <laughs> cameras on the rotation arms to monitor the disconnection of the plugs. Mm. And right. ladies and gentlemen, if you're just joining us, you're watching the live feed coming out from the Wenchang Spacecraft Launch Center. China is about to launch the core module of its Tiangong Space Station, 40 seconds out. The Tianhe core module is on board that rocket you're looking at, the most powerful heavy lift rocket, the Long March 5B rocket, 30 seconds out. 29 years after China's manned space program was envisioned, the first module of the space station is finally being launched to space. Less than 20 seconds out. What an extraordinary moment. All right, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, three two, two, one. One. Engine ignition. All right, lift off. And lift off. What an incredible view. That is the sound of history. A historic space flight carrying the Tianhe module, the core module of China's space station, that itself. It's history in the making, a major milestone of China's space program with the ambition to explore deep space. Not even gravity contains humanity now. And Dr. Yang, we are looking at the view of the side boosters, aren't exactly. we? Exactly. Yeah. This is a camera mounted on the core, uh, core, core stage. You can see it's uh, uh, looking downward. We can see that the, the mm -hmm. two of the four boosters so and we also are the flames. looking down how, at how the did, tail of the yeah. rocket, right? How did they install that camera on that? Uh, this is a very small camera mounted on the surface of the core module. So it, it does not influence uh, the, the, the shape, the, the, the total shape of the, hmm. the vehicle. And also 
don't don't have the right. aerodynamic make influence. And keep in mind, the Lamar 5B has four strap-on boosters like this. You are looking at two out of the four, and yes. they run on liquid fuels. And in the okay. next few minutes, these boosters will detach and fall away after a propellant is burned up. All right, 69 seconds into the flight, everything looks to be going good. Yeah. The core stage will continue to burn after these boosters detach. And in the next few minutes, we're going to see some major steps, are we, uh, Mr. Shu? Look, yes, I think the separation of the booster will be the first thing you will see, even visible mm -hmm. with your naked eye. Mm -hmm. So the strap-on booster provided uh, more than 90% of the mm -hmm. propeller propulsion All right. uh, as of this moment. So once it's in the outer atmosphere, uh, about 100 kilometers off the ground, You'll see the the uh, the fairing also will be separated and deployed. Mm. Yeah. And we're deployed. seeing this 3D animation, animation right. on and the right of your screen, right? And you can see the rocket has pitched over a bit. Yeah. Originally, the rocket is shooting up vertically, but eventually it will fly in orbit. So it's going to take a turn in direction. Horizon, right they're rotating yeah. and they're turning uh, slightly, and now it's heading to the, the orb orbit. South uh, southeastward. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can see that bright orange flame so out of started, the nozzle. Yeah, it started with uh, the vertical flying, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. it would turn. A so the, bit. the the pitch over is the first operation yeah, after liftoff is already yeah. being successfully completed. And okay. as Yan Song has mentioned, the next step will be the separation of the four boosters uh, mm -hmm. just uh, three minutes after the liftoff. All right, that's the major event coming up: booster separation. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Why is this critical to this flight, Dr. Yang? Because separation is always very uh, dangerous. Uh, there are influence of the aerodynamic forces, and also the separation itself has some shock and vibration to the. Mm. Uh, to the instruments. And speaking of that, when are we going to hit maximum Q, max Q, and when uh, is the rocket supersonic? Uh, yes, actually speaking, this at this moment is already All supersonic. Right. That is the engine shut off, booster separation. Great. You can hear the, the cheering and applause from command center. Looks like we've got a good separation. A good, a good start. separation. It's a good yeah. start. Yeah. All right. So, so you now can see it's just the core stage is flying. So you can see also this is, is the uh, camera. Of Earth? Oh, this is inside the payload fairing. Okay, okay. so next up is and that's payload the fairing separation. Okay. okay, that is the core module that we're watching at. We can see some. Uh, there are some lights inside the payload fairing, and also mm -hmm. you see uh, on the right of the window, uh, the screen is the 3D animation. Mm -hmm. This 3D animation is based on the the real date uh, downloaded from the vehicle, the mm -hmm. position, the attitude, and the condition mm -hmm. of the engines. So that was actually oh, based on great. Life. Oh, great the fairing, fairing jettison. It, Another round of applause. It's ejected. A good separation again. And you are watching at the dotted yellow lines, right? What are they? they these are data links from ground Yes, that shows stations, that uh, in which station is uh, connected to the vehicle, uh, uh, either upload, uplink, or downlink. So you see, we have stations in our Xisha Islands, and also we have uh, the uh, space tracking ships mm -hmm. in the Pacific Ocean. And now the Tianhe core module is actually exposed in space, right? That, is that what we're looking at at the left side of the screen? Yes. Uh, the, uh, After look, the fairing jettison. So, the, be, be, uh, so this is the camera mounted also on the, on the core stage and looking uh, forward, not like the last camera we mentioned. So you can hmm. see part of the space station. Uh, Mr. Xu, it's very interesting to see that uh, because the Long March 5B is the single stage rocket. It's not like uh, the Long March 5. And uh, in the previous mission, we can we can saw this the rocket is just to throw it away the stage one, the stage two, and uh, and and just to have a very smaller parts to get to enter that space and enter that orbit. But in this case, the Long March 5B, there there's going to be a huge core stage flying in the outer space. Yes, it's going to be a single burn. I think uh, yeah. once you have the separation, separation of the strap-on booster by the pyrotechnics, uh, we also have the separation of the fairing. So now it's mm -hmm. flying right into the direction and the altitude it requires. So once the engine shut down, it will have a small adjustment to the, uh, to the appropriate yeah, inclinations yeah. and orbit. Mm -hmm. And it will be a separation of the, the, the core stage with the Tianhe. So once that has happened, it means the success of this mission, of this uh, launching phase. And, right. and, and I think it's going to be more complicated than the multiple stage rocket because 
Um, you got a bigger, you got a bigger stage. You got a, you got a main engine that to create is 140 tons of thrust, and you stop them suddenly. It's like a, I think it's like the high-speed train have an emergency stop. Can they just uh, get into this orbit properly? Uh, you, you just mentioned concrete. a very important fact. Uh, fact before. You see that Long March 5B is the only rocket in the world that only have a one and a half stage to come into orbit. So wow. there are many great challenges. For instance, as you mentioned, we use the two uh, YF-77 rocket engines in this core stage, which have a thrust of 50 tons. That means that the total thrust of the core stage is 100 tons. It's very big for uh, when it is shut down to come into the orbit, because you see mm -hmm. that we have very strict requirement in the accuracy of the orbit. Well, for this, uh, for this accuracy, uh, the smaller the thrust is, it will be easier. But you see that the thrust is rather big. And at this moment of the shutdown, the uh, cross stage, the tank is almost empty. So it is very difficult for us to keep the accuracy. That is a great challenge uh, when we de developing this uh, Long March 5B launch vehicle. That yeah. is really an extraordinary view. I think that's the Earth on the left side. Yes. We're seeing right, that br bright, bright light you're watching now. And the rocket is flying over the Pacific Ocean, right? It's actually flying eastward. East, south eastward. South eastward. Oh. So it's because not the because the, uh, uh, the the inclination of the orbit will be 20, uh, 41 to forty two degrees, while the latitude of the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center is mm -hmm. uh, nineteen degrees. So we need mm -hmm. the direction we call the launch adimac. Launch mm -hmm. adimac is uh, going to the south uh, south eastward. Mm -hmm. 450 Mr. seconds into yeah, the flight. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Xu, I think we're expected to see the, the next stage, probably to cut off the main engine. Am I right? Yes, yes a shutdown of the main engine and the separation. So, but, mm -hmm. but once we reach that altitude and the velocity, we will have that uh, happen. So this uh, liquid kerosene and uh, liquid hydrogen oxygen engine will continue to burn. And it will have a, a very high efficiency once in outer space, mm -hmm. unlike in atmosphere. So. Uh, the advantage of ha uh, hydrogen and oxygen engine uh, will will be fully displayed in outer space. Did we hear the engine cut off? The engine has been cut off. Spacecraft separation. Wait. Separation is ongoing and a perfect view. This is the video Tienho from core the end stage. Right. This is a video from the core stage of Long March 5B. Yes. And you can see from the screen on the left side is the Earth, so bright because wow. it is under the shine, sunshine. Wow. Wow, a good spacecraft separation. Tianco core module now is flying by itself in way to orbit. Go, way to go. It's already in the initial orbit. Theoretically speaking, the, the perigee should be about 170 uh, kilometers and the apogee should be about nearly 400 kilometers. Wow, you can see I quite a are, relief for the launch team. That, yeah. It's a very excited day. They have worked years and years on it. I've seen some interview um, from the Launchpad team. They are saying that it looks like, it feels like this Tianhe Core module is like their child. So this launch just feels like really sending off your child. They are excited for it, but they are, you know, they feel kind of sad. It's a mixed feeling, sad yeah, to let yeah, go. They, they spent also, decades on yeah. working for that. How? So you can see the how 3D. Long have they, how long have they started this project? Uh, you mean the whole manned space program? Yeah, this. Uh, we just started the manned space program since uh, 1992. Mm -hmm. uh, it is called uh, 921 uh, project. project. Right. So uh, because of this data, you can mm -hmm. see from the 3D animation. Now mm -hmm. the vehicle, the uh, station is on itself. Mm -hmm. The Long March 5B has already completed its task, and mm -hmm. the station must uh, first uh, stable itself because the separation may uh, brought some disturbance or perturbation to the uh, attitude of the vehicle. So it must uh, use its rocket engine to make it stable and then will be the uh, deployment of the uh, large-sized antenna because you see that there are uh, high-speed uh, uh, transmissions of signals to the data relay satellite. We must de deploy the antenna first and then will be the unfolding of the solar panels. Mm. And that's going to happen wow, in, what, in about 50 minutes time? Yes. That is or that is or that's, that's a great Earth. view. That's Earth. Wow. So what are we, uh, t still talk to us about what are we expected to see. You talked about uh, antenna deployment. That, why is that taking so long to deploy this? Uh, you see that before this, as I mentioned, we must uh, keep the station stable. Usually the uh, rocket itself, the separation is very slight. 
uh, but they still have some disturbance, mm. uh, maybe uh, several degrees per second. Uh, so uh, after separation, the, uh, prop the propulsion system of the station will start and use the small engines uh, to reduce the angular ve velocity to a very low level. Uh, so at this moment, we can call that we have set up the uh, attitude of the vehicle. And mm -hmm. then we'll check some uh, critical uh, system, subsystem, for instance, such as the TTNC, such as the power supply, and other critical system. And then will be the deployment, as I mentioned, the antenna. To uh, This is the preparation for the future to set up a high-speed data link between the uh, station and the uh, data relay satellite. Mr. Xu, I think the, we're watching this uh, Tianhe core module is uh, entering the orbit, which is at the altitude of 400 kilometers above our head. Tell us more about this orbit. Well, I, I, I just saw notice a little bit of the uh, tumbling of the uh, station uh, at the separation. So uh, the small adjustment is very much uh, important to, re, uh, to readjust the uh, orientation of the uh, Tianhe station. Uh, before the deplo deployment of the solar array, uh, the separation seems to be, you know, a little, little bit uh, disturbed, or or some uh, uh, some uh, effects on the uh, attitude of the Tianhe. So I, I'm I'm sure that the ground crew are busy controlling the Tianhe station uh, to the right altitude and the right uh, uh, directions using the small proportions that uh, is for orbit adjustment mm. and then we will have the right uh, angle to deploy the solar array and then once that is done we will ha establish a long-term communication with the ground mm -hmm. and the TTNC uh, crew will have a, a, a good communication with the, uh, with the module uh, so that will be uh, uh, unlocking of the stations and preparation for docking with the cargo ship uh, the cargo ship is very important for fueling the station because we don't have too much fuel on board the Tianhe uh, segment. Mm -hmm. So we need the, the, the cargo ship to go go ahead to supply the fuel and uh, docking uh, with the fueling uh, before we have the crew on board. So we're going to have some adjustment burns and you are looking at a replay of the moment of liftoff. Mm -hmm. A magnificent view truly. And normally, you know, launch providers and launch agencies, they would have a simulation like what we just saw, the 3D animation that takes in all of the live data that does a visual representation of it. That was not a pre-made program, not a pre-made video, but it shows you what is going on in real time. And that will even show you when there is an anomaly, right, Dr. Young? Uh, as I mentioned, the 3D animation is based on the data get from the real flight, uh, the, the position the velocity, the yeah. attitude, and the status of the which engines are working. So we can get the real uh, status from the screen. That's right. The, uh, and the tank is going to pick up this uh, orbit at, at about 400 kilometers above our head. And uh, that's the same. I think it's the, the International Space Station also using that, uh, that, that, using that orbit. Why they just to pick up the why did they just fly that low, Dr. Yang? Ah, you see, that's uh, most uh, space stations and manned space activities in low orbit are in several hundred kilometers, usually not uh, no higher than 600 uh, kilometers high. This is because you see that uh, outside the Earth, there is a radio belt called the Van Allen uh, radiation belt. Uh, the, the bottom of this radiation belt is about uh, 600 or 700 kilometers. So if our spacecraft is higher than, than this uh, altitude, the astronauts will be in influenced by the radiation. So that's not good for the healthy of the astronauts. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if the orbit is too low, for instance, uh, less than 300 kilometers, the aerodynamic drag will, also, will greatly influence the orbit. We will need more propellants to keep the orbit of the spacecraft. So it should not be so high and not should be so low. So in the years before, our Shenzhou spaceship and our Tiangong laboratory usually in the operation orbit about 350 kilometers high. And for this station and the International Space Station, they can work in the altitude about 400 kilometers. As we speak, the Tianhe core module is flying in orbit now, 16 minutes into the flight. Everything continues to look good. Uh, we went through several key separation status, right? And uh, where do uh, you know the boosters go? Where do the fairing go? And where do the first stage land, uh, Mr. Xu? Well, the, uh, the, there are drop zones in the Pacific. Uh, we uh, we normally design the vehicle in such a fashion that the 
the dropping of the uh, what we call expendable launch vehicle parts uh, are not affecting the normal life of people. So mm -hmm. those drop zones will be in deep oceans in the Pacific. So the first four strapped on boosters will be dropped uh, near the Saipan areas, uh, and then the, the fairings will be dropped uh, subsequently in the southern Pacific in, in areas that they, uh, is not habited by people. Mm -hmm. So though, this is also the purpose of the Hainan launch site, and so that would affect the people's life. So as you said, this is an expandable rocket, but uh, I understand that China has experimented actually on reusable rocket, right? Tell us about that. When is that going to be applied to? We're doing a lot of experiments on the reusable launch vehicles. Uh, we have also seen the international effort in, in, in particular SpaceX can bring the uh, rockets back and also even re recycle the fairing. Uh, we, we're looking at the possibilities because uh, the, there are special technologies involved in the reusable of uh, rocket engines. Some of the engines are, are once you, you have, the materials you use are, are for single time only, uh, but the uh, technologies as uh, SpaceX, the using the Mullins engine, which has been demonstrated on the space shuttle, and the technology has been transferred from NASA to SpaceX. So there are many factors uh, affecting the reuse of engines. Uh, the reliabilities as well as the uh, cost-effective uh, factors, uh, whether we use uh, the, the reusable or uh, we use uh, single expendable, because uh, the reusable uh, uh, technology also requires you to, to uh, put on more fuels and to bring the rockets back. All right, Dr. Xu, Dr. Yang, thank you for your analysis, but don't go away. We're going to come back to you in just a bit. And you're now watching our special coverage of China's space exploration. A Long March 5B rocket has just launched Tianhe Core Module into space from Wenchang Spacecraft Launch Site in Hainan Province. And let's now go to our reporter, Ning Hong, who is live at the site. Good to see you there, Ning Hong. So what's it like uh, for mm, you? Describe what is around you. It's actually Tio Yuan here, Ning Hong. <laughs> Well, the rocket had just lift off a few minutes ago and successfully sending the core module of China's space station into orbit. And this is a very unique event because while well, this is China's first space station, although the core module weighs about 22 tons, and the rocket, the Long March 5B, is specially designed and built to send, uh, as, send spacecrafts as large as this into low Earth orbit, 22 tons, I mean, and the rocket has successfully complete its mission, sending the module into the orbit just a minute ago. And uh, I heard people crowd, people are cheering as the uh, core stage separated with the core module. And because this marks that this, the rocket has successfully comp completed its mission. And now what we're waiting now is that the core module has a new uh, solar panel. It's called a flexible uh, solar panel. It will extend from the core module, but it will take more time much longer than what we have before because the core module uh, has a has a really uh, high demand on energy so uh, this new panel will certainly br bring more energy to this core module and as well as uh, astronauts that will be working inside it so now we are still waiting for the confirmation about this and once the solar panel extended uh, well uh, people uh, this mission will complete so we're still wa waiting for this information all right, quite an exhilarating moment. We're truly <laughs> witnessing history to be made here. Thanks so much, Ni Hong, joining us live at the launch site. And you're watching our special coverage of Tianhe Core Module's mission to... Uh, and we're going to take a short break. That's and right. don't go away. Stay with us. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN, 
See the difference.
find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to our special coverage on the biggest space news here in China. Yes, a Long March 5B rocket has lifted off Tianhe Core module into space. And from Wenchang Satellite Launch Center in South China's Hainan Province, Tianhe is the foundation elements of China's planned orbital space station, which will be joined by another two experiment capsule to make up the whole station by the end of next year. And China has another 10 major space missions to be launched by then as it aims to complete the construction of its own space station. That's right. A space station is a giant orbiting lab in the outer space of the Earth. And currently, there is only one international space station which China has no access to, having been barred involvement by the U.S. Congress over issues of, quote, national security. And besides this reason, why China is building its own space station? CTTN's Wulei explains. Here on Earth, an apple will fall due to gravity's influence but in outer space, it floats like this. But how might this apple mutate in a microgravity environment? What might happen when an astronaut eats this apple? China has sent 11 astronauts into space since 2003. During their time in space, the astronauts have carried out a variety of experiments. But the time for each visit was limited. China is aiming to remedy this by building a brand new space station by the end of 2022, which is expected to remain in space for over 10 years, allowing astronauts who spend time there to engage in longer physical, biological, and cosmological experiments. As for experiments, Chinese scientists are interested in growing plants. These flowers and vegetables were growing from seeds mutated in space. The effects of living in space are also of concern for scientists. Knowing how to guarantee the ability for astronauts to have a healthy long-term stay in space could pave the way for future space travel. China's new space station won't just be for Chinese scientists, but also for global scientists as well. So far, a total of nine projects proposed by 17 countries, including Germany, France, and Italy, have been selected for the first round of experiments to be conducted in this new space lab. This new facility is expected to open up a brand new chapter in human space exploration. Wu Lei, CGTI. Well, let's take a look now at some of the experiments that are expected to be conducted on the new space station in China. Uh, there are nine projects from 17 countries that stand out from the 42 applicants since the announcement of opportunity in May 2018. Two related to astronomy, a gamma ray experiment involving Switzerland, Poland, Germany and China, and a nebula gas experiment by India and Russia. Three related to microgravity fluid physics and combustion, one of these is proposed by India and Belgium, another Italy and Kenya, and another by China and Japan. Two experiments are about space life science and biotechnology. A proposal by Norway, France, the Netherlands and Belgium involves tumors in space. Another by Peru and Spain is on the effects of microgravity on disease-causing bacteria. There is also a proposal on Earth science by Mexico and space technology proposal by Saudi Arabia. Now let's talk with uh, Trisha LaRose in Norway. She is the researcher at the University of Oslo's Department of Community Medicine and Global Health. She is also a member of the, one of the international teams whose scientific experiments have been selected to fly on China's space station. Very nice to talk to you. Uh, the name of your projects is Tumors in Space. Can you talk about your programs and why these experiments have to be done in space? Sure, thanks for having me. Tumors in Space is the most advanced cancer research experiment ever conducted in outer space. Chinese scientists on a previous Shenzhou mission have shown that space flight may slow or stop the growth of cancer. The fact is, there is no cure for cancer. It affects everyone all around the world. We've done everything we can on the ground to cure cancer. Now it's time to cure cancer 
but in outer space. Well, let's very look forward to any of the results coming from your research. And what was the selection process like for experiments to be included in China Space Station? The selection process was of the highest international standards. We underwent several rounds of scientific and technical review. Working with the China Man Space Agency has been excellent, but also working with the United Nations gives us some confidence that we are accessing space for peaceful purposes and for the benefit of all humanity. Yes, and why did you choose China Space Station as, uh, as your partner to carry out this experiment? Uh, I personally have a long-standing relationship with China through the International Space University, um, but also experiments selected for flight on the CSS had to be cutting edge, absolutely new, never been done before, and that is tumors in space. Of course, it's scientifically very exciting to be conducting research on humanity's newest a space station and one that is so technologically evolved. Thank you so much for being with us, uh, Dr. LaRose from the University of Oslo. The foreign astronauts and global cooperation on scientific experiments are most welcome in China's space station once it begins operation in 2022. And these were the remarks made by Hao Tren, the director of China's manned space engineering office, in an exclusive interview with CGTN. Since the implementation of the project, we have carried out extensive exchanges with a large number of national and regional space agencies, such as Deutsche Aerospace, the Italian Space Agency, Aerospeciale and Pakistan Space Agency. We and the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs carried out cooperation on applications concerning the use of China's space station. We signed an agreement. In the early stage, we jointly selected the first batch of projects to collaborate on. There are now nine projects to be participated in by 17 countries who have officially confirmed their participation in scientific experiments in China's space station. In the future, there will surely be foreign astronauts participating in China's space flight, working and living on our space station. In addition, some foreign astronauts are already participating in Chinese flights and are already learning Chinese. And joining us in the studio is Professor Yang Yuguang from China Aerospace Science and Industry Cooperation. Um, great to have you with us, Mr. Yang, as always. So let's talk about it. Now, in 2019, China announced nine projects from 19 countries uh, that were selected from 42 applications, making them the first batch of scientific experiments for China Space Station. What are the standards for the selection of these experiments? Well, you see that uh, international cooperation is always uh, very important for, for not only the China Man Space Program, but also for the, the whole uh, China Space Program. So uh, in these uh, selections, we cooperate closely with the uh, uh, United Nations, or uh, actually speaking, the WNUSA, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs and other uh, organizations. Uh, so uh, the most important that the uh, the scientific research must be meaningful, so it should be uh, innovative and creative. Uh, at this standard, we also fit the uh, limitation of the engineering. For instance, uh, we have the standard in the standard racks inside the station, and also we have standard interface outside station for the uh, for the experiments in outer space. So the uh, so the experiment design must meet the requirements of these standards, uh, and also uh, there is a very important factor is the period or the schedule. So uh, the uh, the development and the design of the uh, the experiment must not have the confliction with other uh, operations of the station. Uh, and also, there are other uh, limits, such as the communication, the, the download, uh, downlink uh, limits, or the, the data limited, and also the, the mass and uh, volume of the uh, experimental instruments. Now also joining us in the studio uh, via the video link is Mr. Xu Yansong, the Director General in Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization. And welcome both. Uh, now this is a question for both of you. What are the kinds of experiments conducted in the, in the space station? We, uh, earlier we just talked to this researcher from the University of Oslo. Um, uh, she just talked about uh, these, his research on the cancer in the, or, and tumors in space. What other experiments that we can see in the space station? I think the, be the best environment of the space station is microgravity environment. Mm -hmm. uh, in that station environment, we can do a lot of things that we cannot do on Earth because of the gravity. For example, uh, a, a, we have done this before and many times 
using the recovered capsule, which is the uh, crystallization of proteins. Uh, this is also uh, for medical breakthroughs and uh, a cure of cancer and other disease. Uh, and in, in, in the same time, we're also doing a lot of things such as uh, biotechnologies uh, use, uh, and also uh, space environmental gravity combustions and uh, aerodynamics and uh, microgravity testing for new materials and new breakthroughs. So all of this requires microgravity environment. And also uh, as a human mission of the Tiangong, we also have the uh, constant attendance of the astronauts uh, to take care of some of the environment, uh, the environmental testings and and uh, experiments. So this is also a very very big advantage uh, in comparison with the MN missions. Okay, uh, Dr. Yan, uh, what those uh, which experiments on board of the China Space Station uh, impress you the most? Well, you may notice that there are multiple racks inside the station, uh, either in the core module or in the experimental modules. Each rack will be dedicated into a certain area, and also there are several racks uh, engaged in which can service uh, the provide service for multiple fields. You see, that uh, most uh, the most thing impressed me uh, is the uh, microgravity uh, physics, especially the microgravity fluid uh, fluid uh, uh, physics, and also the uh, the combustion. Uh, phenomena in uh, in microgravity field. There are also some other research, uh, as Mr. Xu has mentioned, the biological or the medical research on the influence of microgravity and the radiation uh, to the uh, human cells, even the uh, cell of cancers, and also other creatures. Uh, also, uh, what impressed me is the some engineering research. You see, that's what we just have mentioned is the scientific research. There are also other research on engineering. For instance, the newly designed instruments, devices, even chips, uh, the influence of the outer space environment to them and to develop the new technologies for the future vehicles, even the vehicles to go deep into the space. And we're now 40 minutes into Tianhe space flight. We're now standing by for another major move by the Tianhe core module. It currently is flying in low Earth orbit now, and it's going to open solar panel wings shortly. And when that happens, we're going to bring it to you in full. And Mr. Xu, China Space Station weighs much lighter, actually, than the International Space Station. How can it meet the international standards? Well, the uh, international standards are, are not done by its weight and size. Uh, because the International St Space Station is built by multiple countries. Uh, the beginning phase, it was 14 countries, including European space agencies, Italian space agency, France, Russians, and uh, U.S. The biggest segment, and also Japan, the biggest segment, of course, is U.S. and Russia, and also it comprises num uh, multiple segments of uh, the, ca uh, the, the fuselage, which was manufactured in, uh, in Europe and Japan, and also the Japanese uh, Kibo uh, segment also was open for international cooperation in the region. So a lot of countries are participating in that uh, uh, experiment, uh, either internally, uh, like uh, Professor Yang mentioned, the different rackings, uh, and also externally with uh, external experimental facilities. And the station is also capable of deploying small satellites. So once you bring a, sa a satellite uh, mostly CubeSats into the station, you can have, uh, have the satellites deployed uh, to the uh, trail of the uh, space station so the satellite can also operate independently. So there are many things that you can do on board, uh, smaller size or bigger size, uh, we can do similar things. So the uh, Chinese space station is, uh, is, a, is a breakthrough for the Chinese uh, uh, space community and also number of experiments are recruited uh, and uh, called for announcement of opportunities by in the international community. And we also uh, receive very interesting proposals, like uh, from Thailand. And Thailand just uh, mentioned about 3D printing for astronauts' food. So today, if you fancy for a steak, you can go to the 3D printer to print your steak, and tomorrow maybe another. Uh, uh, Chinese food. So it can also be done in space. So this is also one fascinating areas that we can look into uh, in microgravity environment and especially in confined space uh, like the space station. All right, Mr. Xu, Dr. Yang, stand by. We're going to come back to you in just a bit. 
China is launching the core module of its space station today, and the station is expected to become operational by the year 2022 and will be the second of its kind to be present in space. Currently, the only space station in orbit is the ISS, or International Space Station, a multinational project that's been operating for 21 years. Now, the ISS is the largest artificial object in space and has been hosting hundreds of astronauts from different countries. Let's now take a close-up look. The International Space Station is the largest single structure humans have ever put into space. Its components were constructed and assembled between 1998 and 2011. In 1993, the United States and Russia agreed to merge their separate space station plans into a single facility, with assistance and components from a multinational consortium including Canada, Japan and 11 member states of the European Space Agency. The first component of the International Space Station was launched on a Russian rocket in 1998. More pieces were added after that. And two years later, the station was ready to host astronauts. The first crew arrived on November 2, 2000, and humans have been staying there ever since. The space station flies at an average altitude of 400 kilometers above Earth. In one day, the ISS travels about the distance it would take to go from Earth to the Moon and back. The space station is as big inside as a house with five bedrooms. It has two bathrooms, a gymnasium, and a big bay window. It weighs 391,000 kilograms and is big enough to cover an American football field, including the end zones. It also has science labs from the United States, Russia, Japan, and Europe. The International Space Station is making discoveries not possible on Earth and helping us push further into space. Every single day we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. The Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer 02 has been looking for evidence of dark matter from outside of the space station since 2011. The one-year mission conducted between 2015 and 2016 was the first of a series of extended duration research missions to develop a better understanding of how each human system adapts to the spaceflight environment. In 2018, NASA's Code Atom Lab became the first facility to produce the fifth state of matter, called a Bose-Einstein condensate in Earth's orbit. The space station is a home in orbit people have lived there since the year 2000. Current plans call for the space station to be operated through at least 2024, with the partners discussing a possible extension until 2028. After that, plans for the space station are not clearly laid out. It could be deorbited or recycled for future space stations in orbit. But humans will not stop exploring the unknown and the endless universe. Let's continue our discussion with two of our guests. Uh, Dr. Yan, compared to the International Space Station, what are some of the new features that we can expect from the station of China that China is building? Well, you see that the International Sta Space Station is the fourth generation of space uh, stations uh, compared with the MIR station because MIR is the third generation which adopted a modular design. And the on, uh, based on this, the International International Space Station has a very big truss. Uh, the main truss has a length of 108 meters, and we can see four, uh, eight pairs of huge solar panels, uh, which have two-dimensional SADA, or uh, solar array uh, drive assembly. Well, our, uh, our station, uh, as, uh, as Mr. Xu and you mentioned, it is much smaller than the International Space Station. This is because you see that we are still a developing country, so we don't choose to have a, such a big station, uh, and we only build a station which can meet, the direct, uh, the, uh, meet our requirement of high technology development and scientific research. Mm -hmm. So uh, although this station is much smaller than the uh, International uh, Space Station, but the efficient sta uh, but e efficiency of the station is uh, higher than the International Space Station. It also uh, has the huge solar panels which have two-dimensional SADA or uh, solar array. So it can rotate in two, di uh, two directions and uh, provide very powerful electricity, uh, usually higher than uh, 27 uh, kilowatts to the station. So it can perform many research. You see, uh, as I mentioned, there are more than 20 standard racks in our station. 
not very, uh, you see that only the International Space Station only have uh, 40, uh, 40 racks also. Uh, so we can do a lot of things and more scientific research than the mere space, uh, mere space station. Even you see that in this initial stage, we only have three, three modules, less than the half of the mass of mere, but we can do more scientific research uh, than the mere. So we also belong to the fourth generation of, of space stations. And Dr. Xu, over to you. The International Space Station has been in service since 2000. It is expected to retire until 2024, unless plans from the participating countries, mainly U.S. and Russia, change. But do you think the China Space Station can somehow replace the ISS? Because if the ISS retires, the China's uh, Space Station will be the only one left in space that is functional. Well, I think the ISS uh, is not going to be completely uh, retired or uh, burned out in uh, outer space atmosphere uh, because the International Space Station is a huge complex and has still retains its value in, in outer space. Uh, so the retirement by 2024 means that the intergovernmental mechanism is disassembled so that this uh, station can be either commercialized or separated. Uh, so that national support would no longer be available. So uh, the Chinese uh, space station will be an important supplement to the International Space Station with a continued effort from the government support and also a continued presence of human beings in outer space. Uh, I think the International Space Station is seeing some agings, but also it's, uh, it's still vital uh, for uh, future missions, uh, including uh, the moon missions, they're, they're doing a lot of experiments on the, on the International Space Station in preparation of human uh, lunar, uh, lunar missions as well as Mars missions. So the International Space Station remains an important infrastructure with a, a substantial supplement of the Chinese uh, station. So the, both are going to work uh, uh, in parallel and for a period of time, I think. And Mr. Chu, uh, you mentioned about burnout procedure of the International Space Station. Um, according to the Outer Space Treaty, the United States and Russia are legally responsible for all modules they have launched. So can you, can you tell us a little bit more details about what are their uh, disposal plans after the uh, ISS retires? Well, that's the very good question you mentioned about the Tian Tiangu-1 and Tiangu-2, as well as the International Space Station burnout. Tiangu-1 was uncontrolled reentry. Uh, so it was very close to a damaged area, but uh, fortunately it landed in the in an inhabited in the inhabited areas. So it was very safe uh, reentry. Uh, on board the International Space Station, if they want to burn up some of the segments, they can do it control uh, in a controlled manner. They can drop those uh, uh, cargos or the segments they don't want to use anymore. They want to. They can re-enter into space and they can design the trajectory so that it will drop in the Pacific or some areas that is uh, less populated or even no populations, so it can drop into the ocean. Uh, but some of the hardcore stuff would, would sustain the burn. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the glass, uh, the ceramics and some of the metals that they can really withstand the re-entry uh, of burning. Uh, unlike other materials, it will, it will disseminate and uh, fragment it in the, in the re-entry process. So some of them will survive. So we have to design the, fa the process in such a fashion that we have joint observation of the ground uh, facilities and it will drop in the same area, a safe area uh, that is uh, not inhabited by human, uh, human activities. So the uh, dropping of the International Space Station uh, is not being planned at this moment. I think uh, the first thing is to look at the, the value of the International Space Station, the uh, amount of money it costs to maintain the, the, uh, the station uh, altitude and, and, and the control of the station, as well as the commercial aspect of the International Space Station. And Dr. Yang, I want to get your take on the international collaboration, right? China is saying that it welcomes collaboration on the Chinese space station from t scientists from all over the world. But the level of international collaboration uh, that the CSS will receive, according to an analyst, will be unclear due to geopolitical hurdles, noting that U.S. law places very heavy restrictions on NASA scientists cooperating directly with China. So what are, how are you looking at this, the prospects of international collaboration? Uh, well, you see that according to the White Book of China Aerospace Activities and also according to the announcement of China Manned Space Agency, the international cooperation will be uh, one major part 
uh, task of the our space station. There are four levels. The first is a uh, uh, joint experiment, as we all you see. It's extended. That's the replay. That's the replay there. And also talk to us about this uh, telescope that we're going to see be joining the Tianhe module. A report yes. says the Hubble Space Telescope will last through the mid 2020s. What are some of the significant contributions that has made to the study of outer space? Uh, what you mentioned is the Xuntian module. Uh, originally, it is part of our station. Uh, it is the original experimental module too. But uh, finally, we decide to uh, let the Xuntian to fly independently. So the Mengtian takes the place of the uh, Xuntian as an experimental module of, uh, tool of our station. But the Xuntian will stay in the same ob orbit of our Tiangong space station. In certain cases, it can be docked to the station and the astronauts can uh, keep some maintenance and repairing tasks. So this is very convenient. Comparing with the uh, uh, Hubble Space Telescope, you see that the uh, aperture of the main mirror of our Xuntian is uh, two meters. The diameter is two meters, only a little bit smaller than the Hubble Space Telescope. But with the new, uh, new, uh, new technologies, we can do more things than Hubble. And the most important, it's much easier than our Xuntian to be repaired or be maintained by the space station rather than the space shuttle uh, taking the maintenance and repairing task of the Hubble. Yeah, what kind of the international uh, cooperation do you guys are expected to see in the future when China completed its construction of uh, the space station? Because uh, we previously we just talked to uh, Dr. LaRose. I think that was a great example to illustrate how important this kind of international cooperation is in this era of space exploration. Mr. Chu. Well, I think international cooperation is very important for all missions in China. Uh, we have also very prom prominent mission of the Chang'e missions. Uh, the Chang'e 4, as a redundancy of Chang'e 3, has uh, collected uh, five or six countries to put, uh, put on board uh, the Chang'e 4 instruments. Uh, for example, the neutral detectors from the Sweden Institute of Space, and also uh, many of uh, the instruments are from Europeans are flying on board the Chinese missions. This will be also true for the, uh, uh, for the uh, Chinese space station, because uh, we want to make sure that uh, developing countries uh, not only countries that have space powers like um, U.S. And, and Russia, but also developing countries uh, among the uh, inter international uh, community, in particular Built and Road Initiative, can also benefit from uh, the space activities that is uh, and space ambitions that are from China, so that uh, the experiments also have the inclination uh, of uh, going to that direction of uh, collecting uh, proposals from those countries. So international cooperation mm -hmm. is an essential part uh, of the space activity in China. And these experiments, space technologies we were talking about, Mr. Xu, they have benefited humanity a great deal, right? For instance, the intelligent control technology developed for rockets has been applied in construction of smart ports, communities, factories. Diapers were initially designed for astronauts in space. Talk to us about these benefits. Yeah, space technology has been derived many, uh, many, in many areas, but also, uh, for example, the CT scanners, uh, as well as many uh, 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 MRI uh, uh, medical imaging facilities are also uh, technologies that, that, are, that are derived from space technology. Uh, mm -hmm. So we see a lot of space uh, benefiting our daily life. Uh, for example, the communications that we use for TV broadcasting, overseas communications, uh, navigation on our cell phones or even on in the car uh, with, that we use almost daily and rely more and more uh, on it has been taken for granted because those are space technologies that are, are benefiting our daily lives. Uh, there's a saying that if you switch off the space for one day, you won't tell the weather, you won't have a navigation, you won't, you won't know your way back and you won't communicate anyway. So it's back mm. to the Stone Age, basically. So s space technology are very important for our daily life, even though we take it for granted, because we can't see it visibly with our eyes, but we do feel it and we do use it. Yeah, we're now about a little more than an hour into this flight, and we're still standing by for that solar panel deployment. Yes. And you're looking at this uh, clock right there in the command center, an hour into this flight, about 3,500 seconds. That is measured in seconds. 
Um, and Dr. Yang, the European Space Agency is cooperating with China on the space station, and there's also support from the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. Uh, talk to us, why is it necessary to secure international cooperation even before the construction of the space station? Actually speaking, uh, you know that our manned space uh, activities and our uh, lunar exploration uh, uh, projects and even our Mars missions is getting some support from other countries. You see that uh, during the uh, during the first uh, several missions, uh, the European Space Agency from support by uh, util utilizing their ground stations all over the world. Uh, because you know that although China is a big country, but still uh, very small comparing to the whole globe. Uh, well, during the flight missions uh, before our, we had have our uh, Tianlian data relay satellite, uh, the coverage of our ground stations are still limited. So we need the, really need the support from other countries to get mm -hmm. the ground, uh, ground stations, uh, the data link from, uh, from the stations of other, other countries. And also, uh, as Mr. Xu has mentioned, we have payloads from other countries. Especially, mm -hmm. I should mention that, you know, that Shenzhou 8 is a, a manned mission to test mm -hmm. the rendezvous and docking technology. But on board the Shenzhou 8, there is a joint experiment between China and Germany called the same box, which performs some biological uh, experiment in space. So these have very great achievements and uh, have benefit to the uh, the science, to the space science, and also uh, to the benefit of the hu whole human society. So in the future, you see that the international cooperation, to my understanding, is already a major trend in the whole world, not only in China, but also in other uh, most uh, space capable nations. So we should do this more in the future. Well, Mr. Xu, um I got us a question because this project has been involved so many international organizations inside, um, including the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs, including the European Space Agency. Uh, can you tell us more about this uh, kind of a cooperation with those uh, international organizations? Well, the, uh, you, uh, the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs is the uh, functioning part of the United Nations uh, Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space. And also, they're uh, they're the governing body of the implementation of the space treaty. So it's a uh, it's more or less of, of the largest multilateral platform uh, that is uh, currently functioning in UN for space areas. Uh, the uh, the, the COPIOS or Peaceful Use of Outer Space uh, the Committee has over 80 uh, members, uh, member countries uh, from all over the world. So we're using that platform to to uh, to place this announcement opportunity. So this is uh, one of the words that we use mostly for once you have an opportunity to cooperate in space. So we announced that uh, the uh, Chinese space station is open for cooperation and proposals. So that platform has been functioning with the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs. Uh, that many countries uh, did express their interest in participating uh, in the uh, payload uh, on board the Chinese mission. And also with the European Space Agency, we have cooperated in many years. Uh, that is uh, based on the telemetry tracking and control cross support that uh, because of the geographic uh, locations, uh, we, we did receive a lot of support from ESA, uh, including the, 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 the lunar missions. Uh, and as well as the deep space exploration missions. Or, sorry like to interrupt the there, uh, Mr. Xu, because we're entering a critical point. The solar panels, it looks like the solar panels on the Tianke core module, they have successfully deployed. You're seeing uh, that solar panel wings stretching out from uh, the main core. How critical is this, Dr. Young? Uh, you see that uh, we can see from the uh, screen, this is a 3D animation. Although it is an animation, but the status, uh, what I mean is uh, the status of the solar panels is based on the telemetry data getting from the uh, downlink. From, so you can see that we can sure that this uh, status is confirmed by the data getting either from the ground tracking, uh, space tracking ships or from the Tianlian uh, data relay satellite. So you can see, uh, we can confirm that the solar panels has been unfolded properly. Yeah, another major move completed by Tianhe core module. And obviously, after the space station uh, is completed, we will send astronauts up to space, right? So let's talk about this. China has selected two rounds of astronauts already. It now has, what, like 17 active astronauts. 11 of them have flown into space. And the country is now about to select a third round of astronauts. And they used to come from the Air Force uh, only, right? But, but Mr. Xu, I'm hearing that uh, uh, civilians now can apply to these missions as um, mission specialist. Is it true? Well, selecting astronauts from Air Force is, uh, has is, uh, simply uh, because of the physics 
and the conditions that they've, uh, they have flown. But I think uh, in the future we will s select uh, astronauts from the common community based on scientific uh, backgrounds. Uh, this is also true in NASA. Uh, once they have the space station and shuttle, they used to select people from the Air Force and then followed by a number of uh, astronauts that are uh, basically with the scientific background. So they can do more and understand more of the uh, of these uh, onboard missions. And Mr. Xu and Dr. Yan, in the in the following stage, the astronauts' crews will be sent to the space station by taking Long March 25. And a space official said in March that there will be another Long March 2F rocket to stand by in case there is an emergency rescue mission. Tell us more about those uh, safety procedures. Uh, well, you see that the, the Long March uh, 2F for the launch of Shenzhou 2F has already uh, arrived at the uh, Jiuqian Satellite Launch Center. The, but before that, we should perform the Tianzhou 2 mission. The launch of the Tianzhou 2 will be performed the next month and the docked to this Tianhe core module, uh, which can pro uh, provide the, uh, most of the supplies for the uh, three months residence of our Shenzhou 12 crew members in this station. So, uh, uh, so maybe in, uh, uh, in, 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 in June, the uh, Shenzhou 12 will be launched and bring three astronauts into this station and they will come in from the front docking port entering the station and then open the hatch of the rear part of the, uh, of this, uh, of the cargo ship and uh, bring the uh, supplies from the Tianzhou 2 to this station. And also we will have the EVA space suits, uh, two of the EVA space suits improved from the original Fatian space suits uh, mm -hmm. to test the EVA technologies during this mission. And as you mentioned, uh, I think this will be a routinary uh, preparation in the future. Yes. Uh, in, in every moment, there will be a, a Shenzhou spaceship and the Long March, uh, Long March 2F uh, rocket uh, in the Jiuqian Satellite Launch Center mm -hmm. acting as a rescue. Uh, as a backup for rescue missions. But if the, the, the former turn of astronauts uh, is safe, so the, this rocket and this, uh, this uh, Shenzhou spaceship will be used for the transportation of the next ex expedition team. Yeah, that reminds us uh, that it's still a very high, it's very risky activity in space. And, and Mr. Xu, um, can you just brief us a little bit of history on did we see any, any of that kind of the emergency rescue missions that has been carried out before in the history? Well, we've seen the movie Gravity, uh, but we haven't seen this reality. But we do. <laughs> we did have some emergency. Yeah. <laughs> we did have some emergency with the with the Russian Mir station. Once it has a fire on board, it was a, a very uh, a tense moment. You have to see, uh, you know, because of the uh, the high risk of the uh, oxygen on board so there uh, the fire is very difficult to contain on board the station so it has to be use extra caution when you operate in the, in the in this uh, in orbit some 400 kilometers above the earth uh, and also be prepared for uh, a emergency escape uh, using the capsule at a time mm -hmm. so uh, it, it occurred uh, uh, once or twice in uh, in station uh, but it was not uh, fatal at that moment. Yeah, and for those of you who are just joining us, we are 70 minutes into Tianhe Core Module's flight, and you're now watching at a 3D animation that is showing you what is happening in real time. You can see the solar panel has been successfully deployed from the Tianhe Core Module. Um, I mean, this is a mission 29 years in the making, but eventually China is planning to send human onto the moon and eventually onto the Mars, right? Dr. Yang, talk to us about the moon mission and Mars mission that's going to follow this. Uh, well, you see that the China National Space Administration has announced that our Chang'e 6 uh, will land in the uh, South Pole Atkin Basin on the far side of the moon. Uh, very soon. You see that originally the Chang'e 6 is the backup of Chang'e 5, but the Chang'e 5 is already been successfully accomplished, so it has a new goal to land on the far side of the moon and get samples back. This is very important, uh, very meaningful for the preparation of setting up a scientific research station in the South Pole regions, as announced by uh, China National Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency, uh, to have a joint missions in the future. So the Chang'e 6, 8, uh, 7 and 8 will be recognized as a preparation mm -hmm. for setting up this ground station, uh, station on the lunar surface in the future. And also, uh, 
if the uh, Tianwen-1 Mars mission can be successful landed on the Martian surface in the future, we will have a uh, sample return missions within this decade. So uh, you know that until now, there is no other countries in the world that have completed a uh, sample return mission from the Mars because it is really, really difficult. So I hope that this can also be successful. In the future, China also plan to have the missions to the asteroids and to the Jupiter and its moons or even beyond to the Uranus or Neptune. And for the manned space programs, you know that our space station can work in space for more than 10 years. And uh, during this period, we are also preparing for our potential human missions to the moon. And you see, last year we launched the Long March 5B like this launch. Uh, it is a test launch. So we also tested the, uh, the new generation spaceship. Uh, a test module. This module can be uh, recognized as the uh, rudiment of the future spaceship, bring mm -hmm. our astronauts to the moon. Yeah, we did get a view of the audience who are watching uh, this flight very closely. One at Beijing, at the Beijing Aerospace City, the premier of China, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang was there, and uh, Wang Huning, standing committee of CPC po uh, Political Bureau, was among the audience. And also, we got a view of the audience at Wenchang a Launch Center. Uh, Mr. Zhang Youxia, he is the vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, was among the audience. and. And Dr. Yan, as you mentioned before, that uh, a big threat for the astronauts is the cosmic radiation. And uh, in our spacecraft is flying, it's just sp the space station is flying at about uh, 400 kilometers uh, orbit. And just the 200 kilometers above them is the radiation belt of the Earth. And, uh, and we know this, this radiation belt will be held in position because the magnetic fields of the Earth can hold it. It's strong enough to hold it in position but it's not evenly distributed. The strength of the, the magnetic field is not evenly distributed. And some reports mention that some part of the radiation belt is, is getting weaker and weaker and is falling down. And some part of that on the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean region has already sank and drowning into the atmos atmospheres. Will that, will, that, uh, will that harm our astronauts? Uh, what you mentioned is SAA, yes. which is located in the uh, South Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. Uh, at this region, the uh, radiation is much stronger than the other regions in the, even in the same same altitude. So, uh, so we have considered this influence, and also the astronauts is well protected by uh, by the space station. But we do see similar uh, similar uh, phenomena of the influence of the uh, radiation. You see that. Uh, some of my friends are the Apollo uh, astronauts yes. who have visited the moon. You see that for the Apollo missions, they must are coming across the radiation belt. That's they right. say that during the crossing of the uh, Van, Van Allen radiation belt, they, they can feel flares yeah, in, they, their, in their when eyes. When they close their eyes, you can see the yes, flash. Yes, but because uh, this is only a very short period, so do not have some uh, hazards to their healthy. But for uh, long-term residents, it is a different matter. So we must uh, consider this, uh, this. And also, it is very interesting that there are also in influence of this radiation to instruments. Yes. For instance, to measure the accurate attitude of a spacecraft, we need star sensors. Mm -hmm. In some cases, especially in the, what you mentioned, the South uh, Atlantic Ocean, some of the star sensors cannot work because of the, uh, the high energy particles also have images on the CCD. All right, you're looking at the light picture from the Beijing Aerospace City, Premier Li Keqiang and uh, the member of standing committee of CPC Political Bureau, Mr. Wang Huning, was among the audience giving a round of applause after seeing successful deployment of uh, solar panel wings. And Dr. Yang, what are we seeing here? Yes, look, you can, you can see that uh, there are two uh, cameras on board the station. We can see the video from the cameras. Now, especially from the uh, screen on the left, you can see that this camera shows that the, the huge solar panels has oh. been extended properly. Mm -hmm. uh, and this means that it's, uh, this moment, the station is orbiting the Earth under the sunshine. So we can mm -hmm. see, uh, we can have these uh, videos from the station. Mm -hmm. This proves that the solar pan panels have already provided the electricity to the whole station, not mm -hmm. depending on the storage batteries. Mm -hmm. So the station can uh, go on its uh, task continuously. Yeah, there are mm -hmm. numerous cameras on this capsule, right? And they have light yeah. on it to illuminate the spacecraft so that it shows up on camera. They can use it for engineers if there to be a problem or 
anything. They want to have cameras on all the parts and components like this one providing you this view. In case there's an anomaly, right, it can be a good visual representation or yes, a good reference yes. of what's going on. That's right. Yes. Mr. Mr. Xu, there are five docking ports on the core module of the Tampa, which is what we're watching right now. It is reportedly prepared for two docking ports, two berthing ports, um, one EVA hatch, and uh, what, what, what are they? Well, I think this uh, comprises the connecting okay, part. That is the live oh. picture coming out at the Wenchang launch site. People are cheering and applauding. You are watching the command. Vice Chairman of Central Military Commission. The Honorable an Leaders, Let's listen. experts, dear colleagues. According to the report, the Long March 5B Y2 carrier rocket has already lifted Tianhe core module to the scheduled orbit, and it's also having normal function. And I declare that the mission of Tianhe core module is a complete success. Now, let's give the floor to the Deputy Chairman of the Central Military Commission, Zhang Youxia, to read the congratulations of General Secretary Xi Jinping. The space station and its headquarter and as well as all of those organs and departments responsible for this mission and dear colleagues in charge of this mission on the occasion of a complete success of the launching of Tianhe Core Module on behalf of the Central Military Commission, CPC Central Committee, and the State Council, I would love to give my congratulations to all of you. Establishing the space station and the space laboratory is one key step of the three-step strategy, and it's also one necessary step to establish a strong space and astronautic power. And the success of today's mission signifies that we have entered into a comprehensive stage of space development. It lays a solid foundation for future missions. I hope all of the staff members could further carry out the spirit of atomic, two bombs and one satellite, and have a complete success of the space missions and contribute to building a modern society with Chinese characteristics. Xi Jinping, April 29, 2021. There you have it. Mr. Zhang Youxia, Vice Chairman of the Central Military Commission, an official confirmation for the command center, the launch is a success. Again, yes. the launch of the, the Tianhe core module is a success. And China has successfully sent the core module, a space station, into orbit. It is going to stay there, waiting to be joined by other modules till the space station is fully assembled in space. And later this year, is going to be yes. visited by Chinese astronauts as China's manned space programs continues to yes, move forward. Yes, and, and in addition to the Tianhe core module that has been launched today, that China is planning to have this ten. Focus space station. Well, in addition to this Tianhe today, uh, we are expected to see more missions to be carried out. Um, China is planning at least 10 more launches of other major modules as well as crewed and cargo missions, as uh, as Shuya mentioned. All right, that is Premier Li Keqiang you are seeing there, shaking hands with all the engineers, followed by other officials. And because of the pandemic is under control now in China, shaking hands is no longer a taboo, we have to mention that. Yeah. 
congratulating the team of a successful yeah, launch. They, yeah, they have been working on this project for decades, and they just kick off a, they just have a good start today. Yeah, what do you think is going through their minds, Dr. Young, after this uh, successful launch? Well, this is a really uh, great milestone, not only for the history of China manned space activities, for China's aerospace, but for the history of the whole country and for the whole world. I can still remember 10 years before, in the 29th of September, in, in the studio of CCTV News, your colleague, Mr. Zhou so Yue, said that we, today we are one step closer to have China's own space station uh, right. during the live coverage of the mm -hmm. launch of Tiangu-1. That is the live picture from Wenchang launch site, the officials there. Shaking the hands with engineers, congratulating them on their hard work. What a historic day for China's manned space yes. mission. Yes. And today it becomes into reality. Yeah, it all starts from this moment, right? But well, it's just the beginning. And a good beginning as well. Yeah. And we have to mention that China is now the world's second space spender and has launched the most rockets since uh, 2018. And Mr. Xu, let me bring you into our discussion. Why is China seeing it as a national priority? Well, I think uh, the, we've seen an increasing number of uh, space activities in China. Uh, in particular, last year we had more, more than uh, 39 launches. Uh, by that we mean there is another one from the lunar surface, ascending vehicle, uh, putting samples back to Earth. So that's in total 40 launches. Uh, activities increase because we need to build space infrastructures. We also have more ambitious uh, space projects and programs. Uh, we, we know in the past uh, US and Russia had more than 1,000 launches each time, each country. Uh, but we're catching up. We have more than 300 and 400 launches, and also we have booming uh, commercial sectors in the space uh, space areas. So space has been uh, a areas that is very intense develop. This is largely due to the development of the uh, of the economy in the nation. Every country uh, space activities and space ambitions are reflected by their GDP. Yeah, Mr. Xu. Um, let's just review what's going to happen uh, in the in the rest of this year. What, what we expect to see. Oh, what's next, right? Yep. Uh, exciting parts is the uh, building of the uh, CSS, the Chinese Space Station. This will be followed by next month cargo ship and manned crew in the, in the month to follow. And 11 launches in total. So this has been delayed somehow because of the Long March 5 uh, hiccup uh, two years back. So the space station is supposed to finish uh, in this year. So we're delaying that for one year, but we're having intensive uh, launches of the space station, and uh, this also, uh, this year we're also going to see exciting uh, moments that uh, in May or June we'll have a landing mission on Mars. So this uh, this has been just uh, newly named uh, the lander and the rover. So it's a single mission uh, with multiple purpose. Uh, we successfully uh, inserted uh, the uh, orbiter into the the Mars orbit, and this year we also had this uh, lunar sample return mission successfully bring back 1.7 plus kilos of uh, lunar sample for the first time uh, in Chinese history and for the first time in 40 years. So uh, exciting moments are also uh, looking into uh, the, uh, uh, the construction and the launching of the Chang'e 6, uh, which is on the South Pole. Uh, we're going to see in situ resource uh, lunar volatiles in this mission and also lots of international collaborations in these areas and beyond. Thank you so much uh, to, for two gentlemen to sharing this, uh, the insight with us today. And that's uh, Professor Yang Yuguan from China Aerospace Science and Industry Cooperation and Mr. Xu Yansong, the Director General in Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization. Yeah, thank you. And that is all for our special coverage today. And we will leave you with some of the key moments from the Tianhe Core Module launch. And I'm Li Chou Yuan. And I'm Yang Zhao. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more news coming up in the minutes with my colleagues Li Dongning. Bye for now.